Hi. Today is day eight, and our focus question is, based on the events at Iwo Jima and Okinawa, what would the Japanese response of an invasion, invasion of the home islands be like? So um, we've been talking about the island hopping campaign, and we hopped from Hawaii down here to the Marshall Islands, and then over here to Guadalcanal, and we kind of had a two-prong hop, 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 hop up to the Philippines and up here to Iwo Jima, then hopping from there to Okinawa, and then the plan is to hop from there to the home islands, to the main part of Japan. So the question is, based on what we experience here and here, what will this thing be like? So the first thing we have to deal with is kamikaze attacks. The question is, why did kamikaze attacks do more psychological than physical damage? So after uh, a few battles in the Pacific, the Japanese Navy was running out of equipment. As you recall, after Guadalcanal, Japan never really recovered the gap between its equipment and the US equipment. So they started to use one of their only options. Um, kamikaze means divine wind, or I don't know, another way to translate it might be like wrath of God. Um, and uh, these kamikaze pilots were literally suicide bombers. They turned their airplanes into human guided missiles and they would on purpose steer their, their airplanes straight onto US ships. So at the Battle of Iwo Jima, which is the main thing we're talking about, um, you know, 70,000 Marines were landing on the island um, and uh, the US outnumbered the Japanese in every way, ships, equipment, sailors, Marines, army, like all of the things. But the Japanese troops were suicidal in their defense. Kamikaze troops, kamikaze pilots, um, like these guys here, uh, literally, in some cases, had their funeral before they left Japan. And then they would crash their airplanes into US ships, um, creating chaos, creating lots of damage, and creating fear. One of the big problems with kamikaze attacks is that there's not really a clear way to defend against an enemy that is bent on, that is determined to die. Most of the kamikaze attacks failed. Um, the vast majority of them crashed into the ocean, and did not succeed in doing any damage, but the psychological toll was immense. Second question. So if this was such a difficult thing and the U.S. was outnumbered, sorry, the U.S. outnumbered the Japanese, but then the Japanese were willing to be suicidal to defend themselves, how did the U.S. eventually win? The main way we won was by using code talkers. So the question is, how did code talkers enable us to win? Um, one group in particular, the Navajo, were recruited by the U.S. Marines to serve as radio communicators to speak in code. Um, other branches of the U.S. military used other groups of Native people, the Cherokee, the Comanche, the Choctaw, etc., um, used by you know the Army and, and other things like that. On Iwo Jima, though, the Marines recruited Navajo code talkers specifically. So here's a group of these code talkers. They were trained to be Marines. They were also trained to be radio operators, and they would talk on the radio in code using something like this. A combination of a letter alphabet, a letter, an alphabet code, and a word code. So instead of saying, um, you know, alpha and bravo, or you know, I don't know, foxtrot or whatever the the letter codes are for the radio, they would use a two-layered code. So a ant, but then they wouldn't say ant. They would say wolichi, which is ant in Navajo. They also had specific words. Uh, in Navajo to represent different things that they said often. Fighter planes were nicknamed hummingbirds, but they wouldn't say hummingbird, they would say it in Navajo. This added an extra layer of difficulty for the Japanese trying to intercept the messages and decode them. There's another layer. Um, there were several words that were usable for each letter. So for the letter E, for example, um, ear, elk, and eye but in Navajo, so these three words could be used interchangeably, or oil, onion, and owl. So the code could be changed up regularly, 
Um, and the language of Navajo was well chosen because there was, you know, only a maybe, maybe a couple thousand people in the world who spoke Navajo and they pretty much all lived. They pretty much all lived in Arizona in the United States. So eventually we did have victory. We're not going to talk about the battle and the combat and all of the suffering, but it is worth mentioning that there was a lot of suffering, a lot of death, a lot of destruction, and the U.S. victory was hard fought and hard won. So let's talk about the story of Lieutenant Onoda, who was a Japanese army lieutenant, um, and he was stationed in the Philippines in 1942. Um, Lieutenant Onoda, and here he is in the 1940s, was sent to this uh, part of the Philippines with a small group of, of Japanese soldiers to fight till the end, to, you know, never give up. They were given the orders by the Japanese army, don't surrender until we tell you to, fight to the death. That's what you do. Um, somehow, the message never got to Lieutenant Onoda's group that the war ended. So he ended up fighting until 1974. He ended up hiding in the forest and continuing the guerrilla fight for 32 years. Eventually his group of soldiers withered down to about five people and then down to three and then down to just him by himself for the last two years completely alone. Um, they hid in the forest for years. They had hiding places for weapons, for ammunition, etc. They lived off the land, eating fruit from trees and coconuts and bananas. They stole things from local farmers. Um, they fought skirmishes, skirmishes with the local Filipinos over the years. Um, the local people knew that there were Japanese soldiers in the woods. Um, multiple attempts were made to communicate with them, but every communication, uh, Onoda and his fellow soldiers believed was a trick. So a message would be posted or leaflets were dropped or, um, you know, loudspeakers were put out to say, hey, you know, the war's over, you should give up. And each time um, Onoda and his uh, fellow soldiers believed it was a trick, believed it was a trap. Eventually in 1974, um, somebody found his old commanding officer in Japan who was like, you know, 90 or something by that point, brought the commanding officer to the Philippines, found Onoda, and talked him into surrendering, gave him the official order to surrender. But what does this tell you about the fighting spirit? What does this tell you about the, the spirit of, of the Japanese soldiers and them, and how willing they were to give up their entire life? After Iwo Jima, the U.S. invaded the island of Okinawa, where we're jumping closer and closer to the Japanese home islands. Okinawa is significant because it had a larger civilian population than some of these other islands. And the civilian population refused to surrender as well. So the question is why the US invasion caused the civilians to commit suicide to avoid capture. Japanese propaganda for over 10 years had been um, blasting these people with the idea that US and UK allied forces, the Australians, the Americans, etc were truly devils and beasts and that they were cannibals and would um, torture you and eat you. This led the civilians of Okinawa to resist, surrender, resist capture and refuse to surrender. And um, many of the Okinawans um, committed suicide in order to avoid being captured or taken prisoner by the Allies. This picture on the left is a picture from recently, in the present day, of the suicide cliffs. The picture on the right is, it's almost cropped off here, is a photo taken by some US troops at the time. This is a person who had jumped off the cliff, slamming into the rocks below. Those are the questions for today. Take all of that, wrap it up together, and answer the final question based on the events at Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And honestly, the story of Lieutenant Onoda, what would the Japanese response to an invasion of their home islands be like? Predict, so you're allowed to say, I think.